Hello, welcome back. Remember we talked about the different types of risk. Now that you have an um, understanding of how to reformulate the financial statements to focus on the various aspects of operating versus financing risk, we're going to take a deeper look at this other types of risk. For short term risk or liquidity risk, we focus on the short term asset, which are typically your current asset, your current liability. And these are include um, a current ratio, quick ratio, um, operating cash flow, uh, and also turnover ratios. Uh, most of you have seen these before in your prior classes. Uh, so I would not um, going uh, go over them in too much details if you need additional questions please uh, feel free to reach out for long-term solvency ratio we are looking at the overall liability so uh, two that are most common is uh, debt ratio or liability to asset ratio uh, or debt to equity ratio so liability to shareholders equity ratio um, Another way to define that is long-term debt to long-term capital. So this is overall liability, overall asset. Here is over, uh, just long-term debt and long-term debt plus shareholders equity. So this, this excludes current asset and current liability. Um, and then also long-term debt to shareholder equity ratio. So there are many ways that we can define liability to equity ratio. So depending on the industry, depending on the particular firm, one may be more important than uh, relevant than the others. So all these are uh, balance sheet items. Um, and then another uh, is a cash flow item or a flow statement item. So these are income statement items. So interest coverage ratio obviously is important. Um, this, this includes how much income do you generate to cover your interest expense. Uh, we can look at interest coverage, coverage ratio on an income basis uh, and also on a cash flow basis. Um, of course, this is important because if you have a new company that has a lot of depreciation, then there can be a significant difference between net income and cash flow. Uh, and then here is a, um, a ratio of cash flow versus overall liability. So all this ratio is intended to measure the sustainability of the firm's um, liabilities. For short term and long term solvency ratio, um, we rely a lot on financial statement data. For credit risk, um, this is more a qualitative data rather than a quantitative data. Um, a lot of times, um, lender will use we we'll start with the short-term liquidity ratio and the long-term solvency ratio and then they will consider additional factors um, such as capacity so this is how much more debt can they take on before those ratios become um, critical um, what 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 is the purpose of the loan so is it to for expansion is it to pay off prior li uh, prior um, liabilities or is it to settle lawsuits so the use of the loan is also important um, are there any red flags in the cash flow so uh, this is also important um, characteristic to take into account some examples of these red flags will include uh, grow, uh, growth or increases in accounts receivable that exceeds the growth in sales. Unless, of course, there is an intentional cultivation or shifting from cash sales to credit sales. Um, but more often than not, when we see that accounts receivable is growing but sales is not growing as fast, that means the company is having problem collecting from its customers. Uh, similarly, when accounts payable is exceeding growth in accounts payable is exceeding growth in inventory uh, that's a signal that the, com the, the company is using the first uh, um, uh, uh, credit extension so they are stretching the accounts payable so by looking at cash flows statement of cash flows and comparing it to changes in the financial statements we can look for some of these red flags um, if the loan has uh, assets that the company can use as collateralization, that can oftentimes reduce the interest, interest cost. Um, and then 
the type of uh, covenants that uh, is included, uh, the current condition, are there any contingencies? So these are all unique firm characteristics that are oftentimes not quantified. Uh, finally, character of management. This is important, um, tied together with the history of the firm, credit history of the firm. Uh, a lot of times, um, company will also use an external credit agency, such as the S&P, um, and to assess what is the credit risk of a particular company. Next, we're going to look at bankruptcy risk. There are different models for predicting bankruptcy. Um, some of these are logistic model, machine learning models. Those are the most common models nowadays. Um, most analysts nowadays use um, some kind of um, data science or machine learning model to predict uh, bankruptcy. Um, the, book, the book went over a, 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 uh, an old model. This is a linear model. Um, so it's also called multi-factor uh, discriminant analysis model. Basically, what is what it, this model does is it identify uh, uh, several financial statement items. So you can see in here is networking capital over total assets. So that's the ratio, retain earning over total asset, EBIT divided by total asset, market value divided by book value, sales divided by total asset. So these are the ratios that uh, Professor at Edward uh, Altman um, developed in his um, in his paper. Uh, the paper is from the 1960s, so it has been around for a long time. In the original paper and the coefficients that he's identified in his paper, he used publicly traded manufacturing firms. So this calculation does not really work um, for firms that are not publicly traded and firms that are non-manufacturing. So uh, today. If you are looking at a bank or a software firm or a technology firm or a uh, entertainment firm, uh, this would the Z score would not work. Uh, we're going to use it just as an example of how how we can use a model to help us predict uh, bankruptcy. So the Z score helps us predict bankruptcy within the next two years. So if you computed the Z score and it turns out to be less than 1.81. According to the Ottoman model, that means the firm has a high probability of going into bankruptcy within the next two years. If you have a Z-score of greater than three, then the company is likely going to be in the clear. Chances of going bankrupt will be very low in the next two years. Between 1.81 and 3 is a gray area. Um, you can't really give a precise probability uh, for the Z-score um, uh, because it really is very misleading. Uh, this model is a, is a very old model. Uh, there are much newer and more powerful model nowadays that, that is being used in the industry. Uh, but the general idea is actually the same. So that makes this model still relevant today. Um, because um, even in a machine learning model, you need to put in factors to uh, for the model to start. So these are very useful uh, factors. So networking capital over total assets. So that's looking at how much um, uh, current asset um, net net uh, minus current liability, obviously. So that's the uh, short-term asset versus long-term asset. Retain earning that is the past profitability of the firm. Market value is more forward-looking. So this is market value versus liability. So this is a different uh, debt to equity uh, equity to debt ratio. And then of course, this is a profit earnings EBIT to total asset uh, is. Um, a form of ROA, and so it measures profitability. And then sales to total asset is turnover. It measures the firm's efficiency. So even when you're running a machine learning model, you can look to the Altman model as inspiration to determine what factors to try in creating your model to start with. So similar to the capital asset pricing model, which is also developed in the 1960s, we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. The Altman Z score model was also developed in the, in the 1960s. And uh, even though there are more powerful models nowadays, uh, this simple model illustrate the same principle of how we do bankruptcy uh, prediction modeling 
We're going to use an example. Uh, we're going to use Delta Airline. And here are the financial information for Delta Airline. If you have not done so, please pause the video and download the template for Chapter 5 for Delta Airline. We're going to go uh, we're going to use this template for us to calculate the following. We're going to calculate the some short-term liquidity ratio. So we're going to compute current ratio, operating cash flow to liabil current liability, and then some long-term solvency ratio, liability to asset ratio, long-term debt to long-term capital ratio, operating cash flow to total liability ratio, and interest coverage ratio. Uh, we use uh, very old data because we knew that Delta Airlines declared bankruptcy in 2005. So we'll also use this data to help us compute to compute Altman's C-score to see whether or not um, there is um, a red flag that we could pick up for Delta Airlines. So let's open up the template. So here are the selected financial statement data for Delta Airlines. Um, remember the ratios that we're going to compute. So I want to encourage you to pause the video and um, take a uh, compute those ratios on your own. So the ratios that we are asked to compute are the current ratio. Uh, we already have the list. So what I encourage you to do is to, again, if you don't have your uh, um, two screens, print out the slides that corresponds to the formulas for these uh, ratios and try to create them on your own. I will go over them with you together as well. So um, if you don't have those handy or you haven't tried, uh, pause the video and give that a try now. Okay, welcome back. So for current ratio, we know that is equal to uh, current asset divided by current liability. So here's our current asset and divide by, divided by current liability. Uh, operating cash flow to current liability. So it's relatively straightforward. We have operating cash flow. So that's cash flow provided by operations divided by current liability. And the next is liabilities to assets. So we're going to use total liability divided by total assets. Uh, and then we have long-term debt to long-term capital. So long-term debt is this divided by, remember, long-term capital is the sum of long-term debt and the sum of equity. And then we have operating cash flow to total liability. So cash flow from operation divided by total liabilities. And then interest coverage ratio. Um, if we are not, if you, are, if this is not specified, the typical uh, interest coverage ratio is based on income. And in this case, um, we don't have any income, so there's no coverage. We we cannot pay uh, we cannot pay interest out of our income in 2004. So here are our um, data for 2004. Once we Included that we can copy it over to the remaining years. Um, for interest coverage ratio, we notice that net income is negative. So EBIT, income before interest and tax, is negative except um, until 2000, uh, 2000. So we can compute the interest coverage ratio for 2000, but for the other years is not relevant. Okay, so those are the short-term and long-term solvency ratios. Do they match what you have computed? If they do, great. If not, um, take a look at what you may have done differently. Um, next, we're going to compute the Altman's C-score. Uh, one thing that is interesting about the Altman's C-score compared to what we have done before is that um, it used end of year financial um, 
financial data. So instead of computing average, it just used the end of year numbers. So let's let's um, remember the fact the factors that we have the five factors. The five factors are working capital to total asset, uh, and then retain earnings to total assets. Uh, EBIT to total assets, and then market value of equity to liabilities, and then sales divided by total assets. So by dividing everything by total asset is actually kind of scaling, um, not so much for um, uh, the ratios. Okay, so now we can compute the ratio just like w what we have done um, with the others. So working capital is equal to current asset minus current liability divided by total asset. Okay, and then uh, retain earnings. We have retain earnings divided by total assets. And then EBIT. EBIT is earnings before income and tax, so EBIT divided by total assets. And then we have market value of equity. Market value of equity, we were not given directly, but we have market price per share, so it's 748 times number of shares outstanding, so that gives us our market value, and then divide that by total liability. And sales divided by total asset, that's relatively easy, that's turnover. So sales divided by total assets. So now we have our five factors for the Ottoman score. Um, it'd be useful to include the years as well. And we can copy that for the five years. Now remember that for each of this factor, we also have the coefficient. So I can put in the z-score coefficient. Now remember once again that this was estimated by uh, Alt -Edman, uh, Ed uh, Altman way back in the 1960s. But a lot of people still use it as a first cut. So we'll just use the value that is given in the, uh, in the original paper. So the coefficient for the first variable is 1.2. Uh, once again, you, you you can copy that from the uh, from the lecture notes. So, just to reference where they come from, so the coefficient for the first factor is 1.2, the second is 1.4, 3.3, 0.6, and 1. So that's where they come from. So the first one is 1.2, second is 1.1, 3.3, 0.6, and 1. So those are the coefficients. Now we can compute um, the z-score. Uh, there is a um, function in Excel that is very uh, handy to have uh, when you need to multiply each item. So in, to compute a formula, technically we need to multiply 1.2 with the first factor, 1.4 with the second factor, and then add it all up. Uh, there's a function in Excel called sum product that does that very easily. So in some product, you have two array. The first array I'm going to put in are the coefficient. And since the coefficient is going to be the same for each year, I'm going to make that an absolute reference. So what that means is I'm going to put dollar sign in front of the rows and columns. The second array is the value for each year. So this is the value for 2004. And that's what I need for the formula. So press OK. So you see that I'm multiplying each element in column G with each L element in column B. And then I'll add it up. And since 
as I copy this over to the next year, you'll notice that I'm still picking up the coefficient from column G, but now I'm using the values from column C, which is 2003. So I only have to create this formula once. So here are our um, Ottoman score and how do we use it? So once again, let's go back to see what the uh, original paper say. So we know that if it's less than 1.181, then the bankruptcy probability is high. Uh, greater, greater than 3.0 is low, and then in between is a gray area. So we can actually do that in here. We can write down um, those values so that it's easy for us to see. So we know that 1.81 the bankruptcy probability is high. Um, between 1.81 and 3, it is gray. And then if it is greater than 3, then it is low. So we can then write down the probability of bankruptcy within two years. So we can use um, some if statement. So you'll see that we use that a lot. Um, so we literally can do the test here. So if the z-score, so z-score is located in cell B32, if z-score is less than 1.81, so again, remember that this is, um, well, this reference is always the same, then we'll say the probability is high, right? And then if, again, we're going to look at the z-score again. If the z-score is greater than 3, again, we're going to make that an absolute reference. Then we know that the probability of bankruptcy is low. Otherwise, so if it's not high and it's not low, it must be in the gray area. And make sure that we balance our Bracket. So you may want to pause the video, take a look at the formula to make sure you understand what happened here. And you see that the prediction for bankruptcy based on the Ottoman Z-score is high across all years. You can also just look at it and see that the highest uh, Ottoman score is 1.37, which is still less than 1.81. Uh, the score keep going down, which means that the probability of bankruptcy is increasing over the years, it bounced back a little bit in 2003, and then, you know, it goes really, really low by 2004. So now you know how to compute um, all these risk factors that are based on the financial statement. Uh, the final risk factor is systematic risk. To estimate systematic risk, we need um, to rely on as a pricing model. Uh, the most common asset pricing model is the capital asset pricing model, also called CAPM. Again, this was um, developed in the 1960s. Uh, the capital asset pricing model predicts that the return on a stock is equal to the risk-free rate plus the firm's beta times the market risk premium. Uh, market risk premium is defined as the market return minus, minus the risk-free rate. In to use the CAPM or any asset pricing model, we have to find real wor world uh, proxy for all these terms. So for the risk-free rate, the proxy that we typically use is a UST bill. And for the market return, we typically use an S&P 500. In this case, the beta is a, the measure of the firm's systematic risk. Um, in the next video, we're going to go over an example on how to use Excel for you to compute systematic risk. See you soon.